What's good, people? Welcome to this episode of the Dope in Damage podcast. Um, thank you for tuning in wherever you're tuning in from. Um, and of course, we are available on all streaming platforms on YouTube and everywhere on social media. Today, my guest goes by the name of Rachel. See, I already had to stop there because I was almost going to call her Rochelle, but that's just due to the spelling of her name. Anyways, how are you? I'm doing really well. Thank you for having me. Thank you for being on the show. So tell us what you do. I am a mental health therapist and emotional wellness coach, and I help people get rid of symptoms of anxiety, depression, and traumatic stress. I help them do the brain work to get their brain to get rid of those symptoms. And, and that's what I do. Well, guess what? I'm such a potential client. <laughs> <laughs> I think we, we all have symptoms of anxiety, depression, and traumatic tr stress at some point because um, those are signs that our brain is having difficulty processing something mm -hmm. and, um, and working through its process for resolving issues and healing and all the things that it needs to do. And so, and nobody's brain perfectly sails through life without having any challenges. So that is um, unfortunately very true. But yeah, this is very interesting. So <clears throat> tell me a little bit about your journey before we dive in into the whole mental health or mental wellness, how some people like to call it. Um, so are you a psychologist, a therapist? Do you like, did you go to school for it? How did you discover psychology? Yeah, I am a licensed clinical social worker. And so I went to school to help people. Um, I decided to study uh, therapy, individual therapy and group therapy. And, um, and so when I got out, I was working with drug users, people mm -hmm. using drugs and um, people addicted to drugs. And I wasn't very happy with the results I was getting. Um, because I really wanted, I felt like they really deserved to heal. And I felt like I could not accomplish that. And so, um, I, but I really got into, so I kind of quit. <laughs> Oh, just being okay. honest. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I don't like being bad at things like that mm -hmm. that are so important, you know, um, and I just really felt ill-equipped. So anyway, I quit and um, I ended up in a mental health crisis myself several years later. I had been through, looking back, I had been through several mental health crises, but um, this one, I had three small children and I just could not solve basic problems and I couldn't realize that I didn't mm -hmm. and I went to get an evaluation and I was diagnosed with obsessive compulsive disorder and so um, that's what I thought I was dealing with it turns out later I now know that I had complex childhood trauma and it was showing up as obsessive compulsive disorder but I didn't know that back then and um, I was this woman gave me an intervention called emotional freedom techniques. It's the first intervention I ever used. And I, she said, try this, it will change your life. And at night, I, the first night that she gave it to me, I watched the little training thing and I was having insomnia, I could not sleep. I was having racing thoughts. Mm -hmm. um, and that had been going on for several, I don't even know how long. I mean, it was like timeless. It was, so uh, it felt timeless at the time, but that night I used the intervention one round, it was 30 seconds. And then I was yawned and I was like, hmm, interesting. I did it again at 30 more seconds. I fell right to sleep. I woke up the next morning and I was like, what else can I try this on? And I just went around resolving the symptoms that were showing up in my life. And, um, and that's really when I started to, and I, and then my ability to solve my, my problems was showing up, um, my confidence, my, um, feelings of worthiness were showing back up. <laughs> uh, and, you know, it was just really wonderful. And I thought if I ever go back to work, this is what I'll do. And Amazing. so here I am. <laughs> Okay, well, this is, again, this is, the, this is the thing, right? When I have people on a podcast, they always hit me with so many, like, things and so much information, and then I have to, like, really, really, let's go back, you know, like, so um, what did you feel that um, the, the addict or, uh, a, a, you know, like, what did you feel that the drug addicts that you was working with um, didn't heal or couldn't heal? Yeah, well, I know now that they... <sighs> Gosh, um, 
the the part of the brain that keeps us stuck from getting rid of symptoms of anxiety, depression, traumatic stress is our um, is our survival system in response to the uh, emotional and mental and subconscious material surfacing and trying to make its way to the part of the brain that can solve the problem. And so the survival system is registering that as pain and it shuts it down. Right. And so here we have all this pain coming up of past memories, abuse, neglect, loneliness, rejection, um, not belonging, unworthiness, mistakes we've made, ways we want to improve. We have all that information coming up from our nervous system and it registers in the brain as pain. Mm -hmm. Right. And so it shuts down and that that information cannot get to the part of the brain and heal. So all we have here is we have all this information coming up the brainstem and lighting up the pain neurons, right? So mm -hmm. we're in massive pain, even if it's unconscious pain. Yeah. Our body is hearing pain. And so what happens there is that, you know, we drink, we can drink or use drugs to stop that pain cycle. It doesn't heal it, but it will get us out of pain. And yeah. so at the time I didn't know that. And so I didn't know that if I could help them heal the trauma, if I could help them get all this information coming up from them that actually would help them heal and is there to help them heal. If I could get that into the right part of the brain, they, would, they wouldn't have the pain responses and then they wouldn't need to use the drugs or alcohol to get out of that pain loop. But do you believe that an addict yeah, yes, it makes perfect sense. But um, that's, you know, like, my only struggle is like, do you believe that an addict could be fully healed and could be fully drug free? You know, I, I think that I, I want to say yes, uh, I watch people heal from these from anxiety, depression, traumatic stress disorders, right, mm -hmm. which are, um, which in, in when you have addiction, which most people that have these disorders, have an addiction to something because we have to get our brain out of that pain loop. It, it has to be done. Mm -hmm. And so when we start, when we can break that pain loop in a totally different way, uh, not only are we out of pain, but all this information is here. It, it helps us with our, our social delays, our developmental delays. It helps us grow. It's our, it's our brain's way of building a new way of being in the world. And so if that's shut down, it's like you're, you know, you're basically, you know, what we have with addiction, a lot of times people are complaining about addicts is that, you know, they're like stuck at the, at their 14 years old of development. And it's true on a brain level, but once that stuff comes through, they, they go through a very rapid maturing process. There's a lot of work in there. Uh, we have to re regulate the nervous system because it's, it, it thinks that everything's a problem and things are bad. And so we need to really regulate that and teach it. You can get upset and then come back down. We have processes for that. You do, don't need alcohol for that um, or drugs or whatever. But, and it's something, this is something that the brain has to learn, not something that we should force people to, um, I don't Ooh, specialize yeah. in, I, I help people change their behaviors through, mm -hmm. or have their brain change their behaviors, yeah. right? And a lot of addiction work is about changing the behaviors so that they can change their life. It's, yeah. um, but yeah. then what happens is we have things like dry drunks, right? Where they're, they're yeah. not using, but they're miserable and they're cranky and they're awful to be around and they are hating life. Right. And that's because this pain loop hasn't stopped just because you stop using drugs and alcohol does not mean that you're not in pain mm -hmm. and, and you're not experiencing symptoms of anxiety, depression and traumatic stress, which make people irritable. And it help, it's very difficult to live a very rich life when you're in that kind of survival mode mm -hmm. for that long. And so when we shift people out of survival mode into the, uh, the front of their brain, brain and their, their relaxation and um, openness and creativity, all of a sudden life feels better, you know, and then they're being creative again. So but how do you, how do you explain a relapse? Um, I explain a relapse by, um, I find that in relapses, there's usually something that is triggering, right? Mm -hmm. So, and we have a re brains like to revisit stuff that haven't been fully resolved, mm -hmm. right? So if, if we're, if we're cleaning up someone's life, right. And we have relapses everywhere. Everybody has relapses. It is, mm -hmm. it is native to the human brain. Um, and so if you have something that triggers you, maybe, um, maybe you went back and connected with your stepfather and mm -hmm. that 
person, you had a very triggering moment because they were part of the whole abuse that you grew up with. Yeah, and okay. just being with them was so emotional and it's all this old emotion that is painful mm -hmm. and it can't get through the healing pathways. Now that loop cycle, that pain loop begins again right there. And we can use interventions right there to help the brain help grab the survival system out of the way so that healing can actually happen. But when you don't know how to do that, um, you're stuck with, you have to figure out how to get rid of that pain. And all of those old ways of being are right available to you because the brain learns everything. And it's like, okay, um, all this pain, what are we going to do? Okay. Well, though, you know, people usually will try their things depending on how intense that is, but at some point you have to get out of that pain loop yeah. and drugs and alcohol will do that to you for you. Okay. Well, let's move on a little bit. Um, can you talk a little bit about yourself? You was uh, talking about uh, um, obsessive compulsive disorder. Yeah. Is that, is that what you said? Yeah. Can you explain to people who don't know what it, what it actually is and how you, how you thought you had had that, like how did, did you? Right. Now, mind you, I was already a therapist. Okay. <laughs> well, no, that's, that well, that's fine. I mean, uh, uh, yeah. who says that a no. therapist doesn't need so therapy? Even as a therapist, I had no idea I was struggling with this. And it's so, always different when you deal with yourself. That's right. That's right. So I, um, what obsessive compulsive disorder is, mm -hmm. is you have specific obsessions mm -hmm. and they can be things like checking, counting. Um, I was storing, um, things, uh, like jars. Um, I had to have, uh, they, they can be really, you need to have things in a certain order. You can't have things yeah. out of place. Um, for me, a lot of that was, and then you have compulsions, like you have these things that you're obsessed with, you try to ignore it and your brain and your survival system, your survival system believes that it's part of your survival strategy and so it needs you to do that so you can survive so your survival system's back there in the back making you need to do that because its job is to keep you alive and so you start to feel more and more anxious or more and more not okay until you do the thing you're obsessed with the ritual and so you're kind of stuck in this being obsessed and then having to do the thing. And then you don't want to do the thing, but if you don't do the thing, you're going to feel really awful for a really long time. Yeah. Yeah. And so you, it reinforces this, you know, this pattern of checking or being organized or, and it's, it's very painful. I mean, it, it, it can really look cute, you know, when your house is clean. I didn't have that kind of obsessive compulsive disorder where I clean things. Yeah, I have a friend who asked that and my cousin has that. That's crazy. Yeah. Yes, but it, it from the inside, like it can look cute on the outside, but on the inside, it's it's very no, painful. It's exhausting. Exactly, exactly. You know, and so mine was more of the mental variety. I was doing things like reading the Bible obsessively um, in different languages and chronologically. Oh. And I mean, I just was, I was, I had you know, that was very, very painful and reinforced by my culture, um, yes. but. Uh, when I had my children, it was, it was, I was mentally obsessed with things, checking things. And uh, it was, it, it was horrible. So that's really a lot of what, but then it's because it was a deeper issue underneath. I really was dealing with a lot of um, issues from co complex childhood trauma, which is like codependence, low self-esteem, um, really powerful beliefs about yourself. Mm -hmm. that I, I didn't deal, I had, a, I was pretty, very high functioning, very high achieving. But when I got married, all of a sudden I was running my family subconscious programming and my family, it was all kinds of dysfunctional. And so all of a sudden nothing in my life worked. And so it just, so anyway, that's, that's a little bit about what was look what things were looking like. But how did you, how did you go from OCD to, um, to complex childhood trauma like how 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 did you even think it was OCD like how was this connected well at the time I I had gone to an assessment and we were talking about um we were talking about what I was going through mm -hmm. and he had said something like okay well um do you ever spend time thinking about what if and I was like yeah <laughs> and I just went off on all the what ifs I think about <laughs> and what happens after I do that. And he was like, oh, okay. And so, and I also, it, which is, that can be very much more of an anxiety disorder, but the compulsion, but I had so many compulsions associated with those. Like I was compel compelled to 
right back in the day, I was compelled to do the reading. I was compelled to, and this time I was compelled to save jars. I was saving these jars. I had this whole cabinet full of jars. I actually should have, I could have, I needed that space for something else, but I needed this because what if we needed jars? It made no logical sense. But if on a survival, my survival system was like, we need these jars. I have no idea what the plan was with the jars. <laughs> Uh, but anyway, because I had these um, this this obsession with what ifs and playing out worst worst case scenarios specific to me, mm -hmm. I also had these compulsive compulsions and and so I there see. we I were. See. Did you did you um, did you uh, heal from this or are you still healing? Yeah, you know what? I look at this as a, as a very functional thing, right? Mm -hmm. Because it, because everyone has symptoms of anxiety, depression, traumatic stress, that, that can mean you have a brain, not a disorder, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, we have a disorder when it impairs our function, when it impairs our ability to ha um, have healthy connections with the others, our ability to succeed financially in our work, with our children, in our own self-care. You know, that's really... Um, when when you have symptoms but they're not really interfering with anything and they move along right they don't just mm -hmm. stop and repeat and shut you down in specific areas of your life you know that's really the difference between having a disorder and having symptoms mm -hmm. and so at that time in my life my life was really shut down and so i in in resolving these things i just didn't my life opened up Right. And so I was just happy living it up, enjoying my children, enjoying mm -hmm. my family. Um, as I as I kept living, um, I I would encounter more deeper issues that I just started taking apart as well from the symptom level, like my codependence with, um, mm -hmm. with my husband, I would find places where I just would freeze. I couldn't have conversations. And so I worked with my brain in that area. And all of a sudden, next thing I know I'm talking, I can have the conversation. Um, I'm in another place. I am feeling he's, he's experiencing depression. I'm totally depressed too. And I'm like, why am I depressed? I'm not even depressed, but because I'm picking up his feelings, I'm doing what he's doing. So I worked on that right there. And then next thing I know, he can be depressed. I'm not depressed. And this started healing and transforming my life. And so I am continuing to grow. And mm -hmm. sometimes I run into symptoms. Absolutely. Of course. <laughs> of course. But, I mean, um, yeah. yeah. Yeah, because I don't believe, I believe that you can manage things. I don't believe you're, you know, like you're free of them forever. And, um, you know, you dealt with it and now you close the chapter. I think this is an ongoing thing that you have to keep managing and putting in check. I, you know, I think of it like, um, like if we were cleaning a hoarder's house, because our brain is when we, when we have disorders and we have lots of symptoms in our life, it is because the brain is not able to do its, its healing work, its growth process, or in its elimination process. And so here we have all this work in the house, all these really valuable things, and some of it's junk, but some of it's really valuable. And we need to clean all of that out. We need to take all of that stuff through the brain's healing process. And that's where the brain gets rid of stuff and releases things and decides what's good, what we should keep, what, what we should do things with. And we need to get that whole house cleaned out so that it's functioning, so we can decorate the room, so we can live in it and make it a place where we enjoy living. And that is a project that I encourage people to do. It's a project I walk people through in two to six months. So it's, it's an intensive work. We spend mm -hmm. about 120 to 300 hours to resolve an anxiety, depression, or trauma disorder, or, or mm -hmm. to end anxiety, depression, and trauma challenges. Um, and so, but what happens is just like when you live in a house, there's you, the, things are going to break, you know, you got to go mm -hmm. in there and fix them. Things are going to get overused. You want to replace things. You want to upgrade things. Um, you know, so there's, there's always a continual management of the self and the inner world and our inner house so that it's comfortable being in ourself. So, yeah, I think that there is that. And, you know, somebody else made the analogy, you know, once you get rid of a pair of boots, you really don't see those boots again. You might see other boots. Yeah. And that's really a lot about how symptoms are. The brain, when it goes fully through the process, it doesn't deal with the same issue anymore. It's like how we don't, when our body goes through the same process, we don't eat the same food anymore. So <laughs> when the body like, eliminates it, we're done. But so it's there's reprogramming. Say Basically. that again. It's reprogramming, right? Basically, you're reprogramming yourself in a way. There's an aspect of that. 
there is an, there is very much an aspect of that. Um, I, we're always doing that process. Mm-hmm. Um, when I work with people that don't have lots of childhood trauma or have mm-hmm. resolved a lot of that, um, it's, it's more about just helping the brain through glitchy moments yeah. and getting rid of symptoms as opposed to, um, with some subconscious programming, but a lot of times, um, those individuals, their subconscious programming is pretty good and it can function on its own and keep upgrading their learning process is open. Um, for other people that have complex childhood trauma, that's, that's a lot of deeper work. And we really yeah. do want to work through the subconscious programming because it's built by our family. It's built by our early experiences and Culture. that. Yeah. yeah. And just because you were programmed in a, in a not very functional place does not mean you have to keep that, but you may, ha- you likely have to help your brain do the work of releasing stuff and, and reprogramming. So um, how do you, you know, we see with, with uh, uh, mental health, you know, especially like um, in, in, you know, like I told you earlier, I'm Moroccan, so like North African and, you know, like generally uh, foreign or, or different cultures, they don't really, you know, therapy is still like a taboo thing in a way, you know? <laughs> so how do you, um, apart from that, how do you, or what do you suggest to people, you know, because everybody, it's, it's very difficult to, to admit or to be ready or get ready for therapy, you know, whether it's trauma, I think trauma is even harder, but also like anxiety and stuff. Like what can someone do to be, be ready or get ready to face everything that they're going through? Yeah. Um, you know, you know, when I, I do this work that I do, I, I feel like I always frame it as we're going to help your brain do what your brain does, you know, and it's not like we're going to sit and we're going to talk about everything and I'm going to do your counseling. So I think that when people mm-hmm. come to me, they kind of, they come with the attitude of we're going to go do some brain pushups, mm-hmm. you know, mm-hmm. and that doesn't have none, the same kind of stigma that, um, you know, you're hurt, you're emotionally wounded, um, those sorts <laughs> of things that that has, right. Um, this is about getting stronger. This is about getting healthier. Um, this is about restoring healthy brain function because when you are experiencing, when you have old childhood trauma showing up in your life every day, your brain is not even functioning in the same way that it would be functioning that for somebody else who's not experiencing that. And so it's like, we're just evening the playing ground of life by actually having a functioning brain, as opposed to one that's a brain that's under the influence of trauma so frequently. And so, you know, I think, and the other piece to this is that because of the work I, these interventions that I use, and I'm working specifically with this part of the brain, the survival system, and then the the, the nervous system, that's what I'm working with in therapy. Um, what I find is that um, because I'm doing that, we don't need to talk about the the memories. We don't need to, we never need to talk about them. Um, I need you to pay attention to them in some way, but really we don't want to activate a lot of pain in this healing process because pain is what shuts down the healing process. And so, you know, a lot of, so we're not, I mean, I will talk with people because there are some people that are, that are verbal processors, but for the majority of us, we have all these other ways of processing them that we, Mm -hmm. we can use that. And, um, and this type of work is, is really quick and it's really powerful and you watch your brain go through its stages. So it's very reinfor- positively reinforcing because you're like, oh, my brain actually does work well. Huh, look at that. And, and that's, I, I, I'm, I'm, I feel like I'm sidestepping your, your question, but I, I feel like if we reframe what therapy is when we're talking mm-hmm. about symptoms of anxiety, depression, and traumatic stress, I think we can really open up to the, the, like our natural desire to just thrive. And, and these symptoms um, interrupt that whole process. Well, from own experience, I can tell you, I'm pretty good at running away from facing my trauma issues. Yeah. And uh, I don't know if I ever will be ready to face them. And if so, I don't know how to get there. And I feel like there is, I know a lot of people who have the same issues, you know, like people are very good in telling themselves that everything is okay when it's actually not. Yes. 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 And um, I think on that note, 
I wish I could show people how, and I, I, I will figure out a way to do this, but how past trauma is showing up in their present day. Yes, it um, does. It does. And, Absolutely. you know, because, and then to show them how quickly you can resolve that and move on with your life. And all of a sudden one area just opens up. It's like, it's like trauma is like a cog in the wheel. And it's not about going back and rehashing it because that's something for your, your thinking center to do. And that's not the problem. That's not where this problem is. Mm -hmm. And the survival system just needs to say, oh, okay, you, all this, um, this traumatic memory, you get to go through, go ahead. That's really at all that he, this healing takes place. That's all that needs to take place here. I understand. It doesn't need to be, we sit and talk about this. And some of these memories are so incredibly painful that if you start to talk about them, it, you just relive it. And that's not, that's not a healing place. You're not that, that re-traumatizing is, is not beneficial and we've been doing that in talk therapy for years yes and and that is for some humans that is they want to talk about the trauma and if that's the case go for it but if you never want to talk about the trauma fine there's way there's great I mean you're going to heal just as well just as quickly maybe even faster <laughs> talking is talking takes a long time this part of the brain is electrical right so we're working with an electrical activity it's awesome Yes, I, I, I totally agree with you. I mean, I'm not a good role model, maybe, but I stopped going to therapy and dealing with, uh, with everything. When the therapist kept asking me, um, every time I'd, I'd go there, she would ask me, what can I do for you? And hmm. one day I got so upset and I'm like, what you can do for you, for me? Well, how about you undo everything that happened? And I'll be fine if you ask me. I mean, yes, like, seriously, I mean, you ask me what yes. you can do for me. I personally I don't think well for me I can only speak for me it was more annoying uh than anything to be asked something like that I mean you know why I'm here you know like yes and that's why I quit therapy <laughs> <laughs> that's it right there because I mean I started therapy back up again right I'm a therapist yeah. I think yeah, yeah 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 um that's why I quit because I was like what we're gonna sit here and talk about this stuff they need like their brain to not be on fire. Who, do I have a, a brain, put the fire out of the brain uh, strategy here? No, I don't. So we're just gonna look at the fire, watch it burn. I'm not interested in that at all. And I don't think, and you're exactly right. If you can undo it, then you heal. And and that's what the brain does when, when it looks at these things. And you don't have to be up close and personal while your brain is doing it. You can just let your brain do the work. And I, I may be talking crazy talk here, but um, it's, it's how I'm living right now. It's, it's what I'm doing with clients and why we can take disorders they've had for decades and resolve them in two to six months. So do you, for yourself, have a daily routine or anything that you, uh, that you do or that you go back to when you have a bad day? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I am I am a supremely emotional human um oh, I feel and I I think this yeah. is just me and my inner world I feel that I could win an award <laughs> for how emotional I am um but I've learned that really the brain uses this emotion as a source of energy and a building block so you know the more emotional we are the more building blocks we have and the more power we have so uh that's really what how i encourage myself but if i don't take care of those emotions i really i wobble um so i i do have things that i do um when i'm feeling a lot of emotion i will i will map out my thoughts and feelings and use an intervention at the same time i used to do this i used to be a journaler um just trying to get this emotion out i didn't know that's what i was trying to do but i'm just journaling 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 and i would go through pages before i could make sense of something mm -hmm. and move on. Once I started using interventions in there, uh, like emotional freedom techniques or thought filled therapy, I now use, I now integrate, um, energy medicine and EMDR. I, I, I don't, I just don't need to journal the same. I I'll do, write my thoughts down for a, a page or yeah. I'll map them out. Um, it's much more simplified because I'm working with, I'm including other parts of my brain. Um, but in the morning I wake up and I hold specific points there, um, energy points, um, to work with my survival system. Cause I'm, 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 
I have found, you know, and the more you do this work, you just, it just, just layer by layer comes out. Um, but I would rather my, my, these layer by layers come out while my life is functioning well, you know, well, to be honest, um, I'm sorry, but I have to fight you for your emotional award because I'm right there with you. So, you know, <laughs> I have the same issue and I, I, I hate it. I really, really hate it. I can't deal with it. It's too much. It's really too right. much. Like yeah. I try, I tell myself, okay, we're going to be colder now. We're not going to care. And it doesn't work. I yeah. swear it doesn't work. It doesn't. So, no, it doesn't. It's really, really draining and annoying. Yes. And then you get fed up with the whole world. And then you know how it goes. I mean, I don't have to tell yes. you, but um, it's very interesting. Can we touch a little bit on um, e e EMDR? Because um, I'm sure like a lot of people who are listening don't even know what it is. I, I wanted to do EMDR at some point and then yeah, I never did it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, you know, it could be better for you that you didn't. Um, yeah. EMDR is an eye movement based intervention and yeah. it is really, really powerful. Um, it's, it's how it's what we're doing in REM sleep with that rapid eye movement sleep mm -hmm. that we do and our mm -hmm. eyes move all around. Mm -hmm. Um, that's when we suspect we're doing our emotional healing and our, like our, uh, rewiring. We're doing a lot of brain work when our eyes are moving like that. Um, I've even heard it said when I love this one, that the eyes are the outside of the brain. <laughs> okay. Like, awesome. So you can, I'm, eye movement desensitization is based on moving your eyes back and forth across the center of your, of your, your, your midline or your brain, the center, you know, back and forth. Um, it also, you can use, um, a pulsing, Sounds, right? Yep, sound or or tactile mm -hmm. alternating bilateral stimulation. So mm -hmm. you can just tap like this um, or tap on your body one side or the other. Or yep. you can get a little device that will do a little buzzing on one side, buzzing on the other. Yeah. Um, those are that's EMDR when we when we have the brain crossover like that. Um, and that is what does it but do? it's the same thing. It's the same thing that happens when we're sleeping. And if that's going well, you don't even know about it. You might have a couple dreams. They're really cool. We're good. Mm -hmm. And when that, when that eye movement process is not going well, that's when you have nightmares. That's when you wake up in a panic attack. And so when, and, and it's just a flood of emotion. And so when we're using EMDR, you can use that to process old emotions, old memories, um, the, the present thoughts, present memories, present emotions, mm -hmm. any emotions, you can get your brain to work on that. Um, what happens with EMDR is that once you start that process, it, things usually become more intense. So whatever yes. you're focusing on, whether it's a memory or an emotion, it will get usually more intense first, and then it will desensitize, it'll drop out, and then the brain will find the next one, and it'll get more intense, and then it will drop, and you just ride this wave, and if that wave is within your pain tolerance, it can be good. I like that wave, um, but if that, if you're already in a lot of pain emotionally and mentally, and you use this, and it goes up past that, then we're re-traumatizing you, and the healing is not happening. And so for some people, EMDR can be very, um, can be, can really create a lot of emotional and mental setbacks, yeah, yeah. powerful ones. Mm -hmm. um, and so, but I find that these other interventions are, um, are a great fit. So it's not like if you don't use EMDR, you're not going to heal. There's other ways of working with the brain and mm -hmm. that part of the brain that are actually even faster and simpler. Um, but I find that my clients, as we're using these other interventions at some point will benefit from EMDR without being re-traumatized. Um, and that's just because as we're working, we're doing so much yeah. um, cre recreation in their inner landscape that they, um, they're not afraid of emotions as much. They're, um, they can handle things. They've had experience with smaller emotions. They fill up to it. They, they, they don't feel like if they have, if some panic comes up that they're going to go fully into that survival state. So they can take more risks than you can in the beginning of your healing journey when this stuff is super, super, super painful. Yeah. Right. And so that's a little bit about EMDR, but if it is the right fit for you, it's awesome. Any, and that's really, I, I, I'm trained in, in many interventions mm -hmm. because you never know what somebody's brain is going yes, to like, yes, yes. right? And if I only train in EMDR and it's not the right fit for you, you have to go, you have to either 
keep talking about it, which is you're not working with the part of the brain that has the problem. And who wants to do that? Um, or you have to find a new therapist that's trained in something else and try that again, rebuild the relationship, re um, call all the people around, you know? So mm -hmm. I find that it's really helpful to have multiple interventions to try out to see which ones or which one helps your brain to do its healing work. So real quick touch um, on the um, emotional freedom technique. I think I thought that sounded also very interesting. Yeah, um, that one is using the body's meridian system, just like in acupuncture, mm -hmm. and but without needles, and you're just tapping on the points. And so um, because the survival system in our brain, it's listening so intently to the body, that's its native language. It's like, talk to me, body. Are we good? Are we dying? Tell me. And so... <laughs> that's all it cares about and so when it's receiving messages from the body that hey we're good it's like okay we're good and so it'll sit back and let healing happen it'll unblock the healing pathways and things are moving and so you can use points on your body to send that in that communication to your survival system and it will allow healing to happen um, emotional freedom techniques like emdr also desensitize things like if you have a painful past memory and you use emotional freedom techniques with it or emdr or energy medicine or thought field therapy um, and there's several others but if you use it with that memory and let's say the intensity when you start out is like a 10 like you don't even want to deal with that you don't want to go near it um, and you're using an intervention with that all of a sudden it'll come down to an eight to a six to a three, to a two. And all of a sudden you're just not afraid of it anymore. And your brain isn't either. And so it makes it easier to make it through the brain's healing process when that's also desensitized. So these, so emotional freedom techniques by using this, by being able to send that we're okay message to your, to your survival system does those two things. It desensitizes the, the issue and it also moves the survival system. It influences it not to block the path, the, the process. And so you get that thing moved through there in 20 seconds, 30 seconds, two minutes, and it's done. Then the brain takes it from there. I don't find that that part really needs very much help. Sometimes, it, it, anyway. Very interesting. Thank you so much. You <laughs> yes, know. this was um, a lot and I love it. I think, uh, as you say, it's all about how the brain processes and um, I feel like depression doesn't go away by talking about it every week to a therapist. Mm -hmm. I feel like this needs, and, and, and this is where for me, a lot of therapy it might be good for people as you said to talk you know because you know with the therapist you can be open you're not uh, you know you're not being judged and it's not like talking to a friend you can be open but obviously a therapist is different again you know you go you get to go deeper but for me I was always missing the tools you know yeah. like how do we make this go away how do we make this better you know I mean it's good that we could talk but yes you know I can write everything down, as you said. <laughs> yes. And, you know, I think that um, therapy is really wonderful for support. I mean, yes. going to, uh, it's wonderful for support. And, yes. it, you know, that's great. And it's really wonderful for um, advice from an expert in a specific area of your yeah. life, relationships, children. Um, that's great. Um, for symptoms of anxiety, depression, traumatic stress, yes. that stuff, that's that's a whole different ball game. That's really exactly. when you want to get the brain to heal itself. We need to get that stuff out of the body, um, we, right? Because it's like, when you get all emotional, if you'll check, watch yourself, you'll feel it in your chest, you'll feel it in your stomach, you'll feel it in your shoulders. Your whole body is saying, I'm not okay. And as long as that's going on, we can talk about things till we want to, but as long as the body is sending messages of distress to your brain, your survival system is running the show. And mm. that, that looks like, you know, fight, flight, freeze, faint, fawn, and just not, not the good stuff. We want, we want the front of your brain really being able to get all this information, solve these problems that we're going through and really create a life where it fits us, not our trauma so yeah i like that that's a nice closing uh phrase so um thank you so much for joining me today and sharing all of this with me and everybody else who's listening or watching us um we will have everything in the show notes for people to reach out to you all your socials and all your website your website and everything that you provide us with 
So once again, thank you so much. I can definitely say I learned a thing or two or three. <laughs> and um, yeah. Um, well, thank you for having me. Anytime, definitely. Hope you guys enjoyed, enjoyed this episode as well. And definitely don't hesitate. If you ever need help, reach out. There is definitely different, um, you know, there's different uh, things. It's not just like about talking. If you don't want to talk, how Rachel, Rachel said, oh my God, <laughs> um, there is other tools. And um, I'm very happy that um, you educated us about this today. Yeah. Thank you so much. You're welcome. All right, guys, um, I'll be back with a brand new episode. I cannot talk today. I talk too much. I already had too many podcasts. All right. <laughs> Thanks for tuning in, guys. And uh, see you guys next week with a brand new episode. Bye.